Well, welcome everybody. Um, I know many of you will have travelled here by train. Um, put your hands up if you travelled by train. And keep your hands up if you were worried about your safety whilst on the train. Oh, to, 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 a couple of people, but not, not very many. Um, and the reason I'm asking you about that relates to, to this. Anyone seen one of these before? This was actually um, developed by Charles Babbage, which some of you may have heard of before, but more in his connection with the difference engine, which was a precursor to today's modern computers. But he actually developed this dynometer car after a near miss he had with his mate Brunel. Um, you can imagine the loss of science if there'd been a head-on collision between Babbage and Brunel. But fortunately, they averted that, and he developed this dynometer car because he felt that humans weren't a reliable source of information on the events leading up to an accident. And this is actually then became the precursor to um, what we call a black box recorder in aeroplanes and things. Um, and when this car, when he developed this, um, he didn't actually get recognition for developing this, and he died without recognition either for his work um, that led to the development of computers or for the development of black box computers, sorry, or black box um, flight recorders. But actually, um, the year he died, by coincidence, is when the rail inspector set up. And that the work of the rail inspectors helped you all arrive here safely today because they have learned from rail accidents since 1871 to today and put in new safety measures such as things that identify if drivers go through a signal. They also think random things like putting toilets on platforms just so drivers can uh, relieve themselves and therefore concentrate on driving you safely to your destination. But, but why am I telling you this? Well, as, as Jason explained, my research um, has looked at how organizations learn from cyber incidents. As he mentioned, I spent nearly a decade working for Shell in the energy industry. And that, when you work in the energy industry, you spend a lot of time looking at safety and how you learn from safety incidents. And it struck me that we don't have the same um, approach to learning from cyber security incidents. So I, I think Jason sort of explained that I'm doing a PhD was really to dig into how do organizations learn from incidents and are there opportunities to improve them? So let me ask you a question. How well do you think your own organization learns from cyber security incidents? And, and that's one that you can keep to yourself. But as I go through, I'm going to talk about what the research that I did, what some of the key findings were, and you can see if what I found was similar to your own organization, and then give you some takeaways in terms of things that you can take back to your own organization and hopefully improve how you learn from incidents. Um, and I will also allow some time at the end for some questions as well. Um, so you get a chance to ask anything that you particularly want to dig into. Because, you know, talking about your PhD, I could talk for hours, right? and we don't have hours there. So I'm going to condense it into a short um, summary. So I began my research by looking at um, what do the industry standards say? I mean, we, we heard earlier that the NIST is a sponsor for this event. NIST has 800 dash 61 as one of its standards around incident management handling. And in there, it has a section that says that you should go back and learn from your um, incidents. Similarly, we have ISO 27 and 35 part two, um, which also has a, a an element of that in. And all of the industry standards have some activity that they label either follow up, post-incident review, something like that, that says when, by the time you've had an incident, you should go back, and then that will fuel you learning um, and improving your security. 
However, the guidance is very, very light. It kind of assumes that you could go round and collect the lessons as if they're left lying about the office and all you have to do is pick up those lessons um, and then put them in place. There has been some existing research on this area, but very, very limited academic research. And most of that's concentrated on how do you identify the causes um, and hasn't really looked at how do you know about all of the incidents and, and do you even make sure that the, what you've learned is actually implemented. They do have recommended something called double loop learning. So this is kind of like if you've had a, a phishing attack, do, do you look at um, not only the fact that you had an attack, but what were the conditions that enabled that attack to happen uh, and to spread and to escalate or maybe remain undetected? So asking why and digging into those underlying causes. Um, in contrast to sort of the lack of academic cybersecurity research, safety researchers have looked into this area quite extensively. Often they're funded off the back of some serious incident or something like that. And what the, the difference they've looked at it is they've looked at learning as a very much of a subjective and social process. So they've looked at who decides something is an incident, who decides these are the causes, and who decides um, what the lesson is, and who makes sure which lessons actually get implemented. And they've really recognised the difference between identifying lessons and actually implementing or learning the lessons. Having the knowledge doesn't make a difference, right? It's only when you actually make a change due to that knowledge that you can say that you've actually learned something. So for my research, I wanted to look at that whole process from how do organisations identify incidents, hear about incidents, how do they dig into the causes of them, which ones do they look into, how do they identify the lessons and, and how do they make sure the lessons are learnt. I interviewed about 34 um, CISOs or direct reports of CISOs. These were all large organisations with operations based in the UK. And I think with the exception of about three of them, they were actually multinational organisations as well. Um, from those interviews, I got some of the ideas around the challenges that organisations had, which helped me develop then the recommendations and then I took those recommendations back out to practitioners, such as yourselves, to say which do you think um, are relevant um, and which ones are the priorities. And I will share with you at the end of this the validated and updated recommendations that came out of that, that work. Um, I think there's some other academics. So I have had a couple of academic papers published, which I will share links to as well. So the findings from my research, the first one is, is some good news, is that there was more learning going on than had previous researchers had found. The bad news is I think this learning was going on because there's been more cybersecurity incidents, so people are getting that, the hang of that. The core finding, this, this circle here, is really around that no, organisations weren't looking at how they learn from cyber incidents. So a lot of companies were interested in my research because they'd never actually thought about how they learn from cybersecurity incidents. And then round the edge of this are some of the challenges that they had. So there's really a gap between identifying all of the potential lessons that um, you can learn from an incident and actually doing that. So as I'll go through each of these challenges of uncovering incidents, um, finding out the right causes, and then actually implementing the lessons as well. So the first one about no conscious reflection if their practices are effective. You know, everybody I spoke to thinks it's useful to learn from incidents, and most people as individuals and as organisations, say they like to learn from their mistakes. It's an easy thing to say. 
But when I've drawn on, um, in my academic thing, a couple of theories, one called neo-institutional theory, um, another one around organisational learning theory, these are both from management science. And I, I haven't got the time to delve into the detail of that, happy to cover it with people individually. But they talk about explaining why organisations sometimes have practices um, in place, that, but they've never really effectively thought, is this the right practice for my organisation? They kind of go through the motion of this. What they say, it, it kind of gives them a veil of legitimacy. If you go to a, a top organisation, you would imagine they would have some kind of post-incident review process. But is it the most effective? They haven't really thought about it. There were fairly standard um, practices across all of the organisations. Everybody did have some kind of process for some kind of incidents and produce some kind of report. Um, but what was interesting is there was no standardisation on categorisation. So organisations categorise incidents sometimes on a scale of one to three, sometimes on a scale of one to five, gold, bronze, silver, any, anything like that. Some split out data breaches from cybersecurity incidents. Some included OT incidents, um, also things like fraud, if it was business email compromise, that type of thing. Others kept them separate. So there's a real mishmash of what even is called an incident. So be really very wary if you look at um, headlines that say, you know, the number of cybersecurity incidents has gone up here, or this percentage of cybersecurity incidents is attributed to human error. Well, how are you even counting incidents? Um, there were some that were also analysing lower levels of incidents. So when less serious incidents, they were looking at the themes and the trends coming from those. And most people, even if they weren't doing that, said that they had a desire to move in that direction and saw value in doing it. When I asked if they knew if their learning process was effective, most people confessed they hadn't actually assessed it and they kind of like thought about it and then were like, well, I haven't had a repeat incident exactly the same, so I must have learned. Um, but some actually did confess that they had had repeat incidents. Um, so they hadn't, or very similar incidents. Um, so they hadn't learned. And then when I tried to explore why, that was perhaps either because they knew it was an issue and they just didn't have the resources or time to address that. There were other priorities. Or um, sometimes they had fixed it, but over time the um, controls had degraded and then they were coming up with a similar issue again. None actually mentioned that they had, during one of their post-incident reviews, reflected back and thought, had, if we had learned about this previously, we wouldn't have this incident now. So I think there's a, an, an opportunity there. But let me move on to the next challenge, which was around uncovering um, incidents. So this is about hearing about incidents. How do you even get, get them into your process? And there's two angles to this. On, on the one hand, you have um, those from internal in your organization, your employees, um, and that includes your IT department, et cetera, but also then externally, your customers, your suppliers, um, your peers as well. Um, and just because um, people know about an incident, they need to know that it's on them to actually report it. They need to know how they should report it, that it's their role to report it, and who they should report it to. Um, and people often said to me, well, we have an open culture at this organization. I'm sure people would report incidents to them. And so, obviously, I ask, how do you know? How do you know that people would do? Um, but people hadn't really ever checked. Um, and, and researchers would say, you know, this is the difficulty of hearing silence. You know, you don't know what you're not being told. Just because you've had some reported, you don't know which incidents aren't there. And particularly when it comes to suppliers, when I asked people if they felt that they were comfortable that suppliers would tell them about all their incidents, 
particularly if they thought they could get away without declaring it, um, they often told me that they, they knew that wasn't the case because they had found out about an incident at one of their suppliers in the press or through another contact at another organization. And it's clear that their suppliers weren't telling them about all of the incidents. It's also very hard for people to admit that they made a mistake. All of us as humans manage the perception that others have of us. So to admit that we've screwed up and made a mistake, you need to have that psychological safety in your organization that people feel that they can come forth and admit they've done something wrong. And organizations, I mean, I'm sure if I ask you to put your hands up if you're busy, everyone's gonna put their hands up, right? And when you're really busy, you can send, unintentionally send out a message to people in your organization that you don't want to be bothered by what might be small anomaly, anomalies or um, little things, minor incidents that people are a bit uncertain of. They think, oh, IT's really busy, I won't trouble them with, with these issues. Um, and, and one of the interesting things is that even though organizations want to hear from others, like their suppliers and, and their customers, they're also very hesitant to share their own information. Um, and, and they explain, you know, part of this is at the start of an incident, you don't necessarily know what the whole impact is. And depending on the countries you're in and the different jurisdictions, different laws and regulations apply. But they recognize they wanted to learn from others. And so you get this um, paradox where people recognize it's important to share information across the supply chain, but equally everybody else is keep putting, keeping their cards close to their chest. Um, so that's definitely one of the one of the, the challenges, um, which leads me on to my next one. Well, how do you find out about the causes if you don't even hear about the incidents? As I mentioned, most organizations go through some kind of ritual post-incident review, at least for the high severity incidents. But most of them also felt that there was some room for improvement. I mean, Forensic analysis is a bit like the Babbage's dynometer car, right? It, it can tell you what, what actually happened at a technical level. But what it doesn't touch on is the choices that contributed to allowing that incident to actually happen. So if, for example, you had um, an incident which was known, you, you had something around maybe the account structure, um, and the governance knew that there was an issue with this, but it was a legacy system and you've deferred investment on it. It's the history of that decision making that you need to learn the choices from where the incident happened. And only two of the organizations that I spoke to had any kind of formal method to understand and look at causes. Most were sort of, you know, get everybody in a room and talk about it but didn't have a structured way of identifying what could have contributed to an incident. And people had um, different views on who should be involved in a post-incident review. Some felt that external facilitation was really useful. Um, a lot mentioned it was really important to involve the business leaders, but then they weren't always choosing who could, would actually be in the room. And if I go on to the third one, was the challenges of actually implementing the lessons. Even if you have the best ever report or post-incident report that the world has ever seen, unless you do something with that, it doesn't change the security of your organization. It's not until you make changes that, come, that are recommended in that report that you've actually improved security. And people said this was hugely important, but really difficult to do well. Some organizations like banks had quite formal reporting processes. And they, um, in the one hand, that was really good because they tracked and they were chased by regulators, audit committees, etc. 
but it also had this side effect of nobody wanted to put their name against certain actions, particularly if they were difficult to achieve, like improving culture or tackling some legacy infrastructure. So what you found is that the, less, the lessons that were agreed to started to become very narrow because they were then being tracked so closely. Um, and they found that senior sponsorship was vital to actually get in um, there to make sure that the you get the right prioritization and the resources there to make sure that people actually implemented the lessons. So let me move quickly on to the last um, sort of key takeaways from this. So these are the recommendations that were validated during my research. Unsurprisingly, the first one is really around hearing about those incidents. So how do you make sure that you actually have that open culture? that you've created the psychological safety for people and given them the means and also the motivation to report incidents to you. It's really important that you provide updates to people who report incidents to you so it retains that um, motivation to do so because perceptions, will, even, whatever you say in your official training, people will judge what happens to other colleagues um, in terms of their decisions to report something to you. Also, sharing with peers, trusted peers, was really important in terms of hearing about other incidents. But you need, needs to be the right forum so that people will share with people and there's no negative repercussions. For supplies, uh, cooperation is crucial and it's really important to say this up front and early. So for an instance, an organization might expect a supplier to let them know early when there's an incident, even if they don't have all of the details. You need to have those discussions with the suppliers and explain, you know, maybe you can help them investigate that incident. So it's giving them the motivation and the means to, to tell them to let you know about the incidents. It may be you even hold joint post-incident reviews with your suppliers, if, if that's appropriate. And definitely consider who is going to attend those post-incident reviews, because not only can it increase their understanding of the risk if they um, attend the post-incident review, but it's so important to then lead on to the next stage, which is getting that ownership of implementing the lessons as well. People felt that you couldn't do a really good job on post-incident reviews for every type of incident. So be really clear about which ones you want to learn from and why you're choosing those ones to learn from. But also consider then looking at all the other incidents to see if there are themes or, or patterns coming out of them. Delving into the underlying causes was the top-rated uh, recommendation out of the people that I um, surveyed followed by the second one, which was championing the structural causes, although people knew that that was a difficult thing to tackle. Um, people emphasized the importance of really enterprise architecture levels in, in tackling those, um, and also sort of transformational programs that you can put in place to, to tackle those closes. And key to either of those is the right governance level. Um, and making sure things are actually prioritized. And, and lastly, it's really around making sure it's not just that a lesson, any lesson is learned and delivered, but it's actually the right lesson. So has it addressed the risk that you thought it would do once it's implemented? So I think in, in conclusion, and I'll put these here as well, firstly, there is an opportunity to improve your security by learning from incidents. Secondly, learning is a social process. It's an organization capability that you can improve and develop and get better at. And thirdly, how you approach learning shapes that the lessons you learn and how much you'll improve your security from that learning process. So what changes have I mentioned will you write down as things to take back to your own organizations? And I've put these up here um, because those of you who are not academic might prefer to look at some of these more um, 
easy to read uh, books if any of the topics um, interest you. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions either on LinkedIn or in the breaks, but also some questions now if you'd like to raise them. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic. So firstly, that's fine, clear. <laughs> the challenging task of <clears throat> picking from presumably hundreds of questions. There'll be mics as well for you. Okay. Um, do you think there would be scope for something like the um, maritime and air, air travel industry of um, an independent organisation to which you could, for reporting near misses, for sharing information between the organisations? Because obviously if an incident hasn't actually occurred, then in most things, there wouldn't be any requirement to report it to ITO. Probably a supplier wouldn't feel they need to report it to um, their customers or whatever. But obviously, lessons can be learned from near misses because often it's a case of, yes, it didn't happen, but only just because yeah. one thing prevents The it lucky from, ones, yeah. Yes, exactly. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it, it's a, a really interesting question that people have, have raised. And a lot of the people I spoke to drew analogies with aviation and maritime and, and some of those organizations. Um, people felt that, that there was an opportunity for some of those organizations to step in there. Um, and what stopped some of them was the concern around legal um, implications and repercussions from that. Um, I do think it depends on how you want to cut it, because you could say, well, actually, maritime should add cyber to their list of risks and those in aviation and, and others, because each of those industry organizations has um, a cyber element to them, or you could happen at the national level. So I did collaborate with NCSC on some of those, and the NCSC does have the trust groups, but only for certain industries. So I think there, there is a space for um, a role of that kind of organization um, to step in and help, help us on that. Okay, great, I think there was one next door and then and then we'll come up with that side <laughs> and then definitely there. Um, how would you set expectations when it comes to incidents because there's a lot of panic when it comes to discussing vulnerabilities that we as security professionals know might not be a big issue um, but the more it spreads then the more that panic builds and I was wondering what your view on that was. Um, yes yeah, so it's, you're saying like actually in the heat of the incident how do you keep that calmness there yeah. I mean part of it is around um, having that psychological safety that people can then be very open and honest about exactly what they're seeing um, and then I, I mean I worked in the operational roles as well I think the more practiced you are as a team around crisis management, so you have a plan and it's like, okay, right, we're now evoking the plan. We're going to have update calls at 10 o'clock and at 4, 4 p.m. and this is how we do it. And you start getting into a, a mechanism to do that. And it's really on the leaders then to set that tone of not trying to blame or get angry with people, particularly at, at the moment you're trying to respond to it, but setting that tone for people to be... Um, to ask questions and to come forth with the data that they have. Brilliant, thank you. Great, so question here and then at the back. Thanks again for the presentation. I look at things from a different perspective in terms of um, your lessons learned is at the end of it when you're doing your security improvement plan and all that. Mm. But what's your view around tabletop exercise, doing the serial testing ahead of just to look at all the different you know, touch points you, that could arise and do a walkthrough so there's that awareness. What's your view on that? So, sorry, so I missed the crucial word there. So on tabletop exercises. Oh, tabletop, yes. So I think that's really important to, to do that. And I think that people actually had taken lessons from tabletop exercises, so not even real incidents, but running those tabletop exercises and uh, simulations, they found lessons from that. And sometimes that's easier to absorb because it's not real. So people haven't got to, to your that, this gentleman's point. People are not sort of in that panicked, angry moment because it's it's not real. So you can have that a bit calmer reflection and people are happier to, to say things hadn't gone well and take the lessons from that. So yeah, I would say that's really, 
really important. Why wait for a, a real incident? Take the lessons from a, um, a controlled experiment. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I've been on a few incidents, uh, post-incident reviews, um, and a lot of the time the roadmap or the input, you know, the, the, the recommendations are based around more technical changes that need mm. to happen at the organisation. A lot of your findings were, were very much more around culture and, and, and looking at the culture of the organisation. You know, you talk about psychological safety, which is obviously great for what we're trying to look at today. I just wondered if you had any um, recommendations around how you ensure that the, the human side, the culture side of that roadmap is is prioritised more? I think it's about understanding what are the contributory conditions that enabled an incident to happen. So yes, there's the technical aspect. Um, you recently shared the British Library um, lessons learned. So if I take that as a public example, because they've been very open with it. So they had a server that um, IT suppliers were logging into that didn't have MFA. So you could look at it and say, well, the answer is to put MFA onto that server. However, um, the reason that they were vulnerable to that attack was also because they had a flat network infrastructure. They also incidentally knew about the risk of the server and, and had risk accepted it um, because they had a plan to do stuff. So are there some questions to ask about what was known and the fact that they risk accepted it? Why did they have this flat, flat network? They knew that was a risk. Why had they not tackled this? But also, uh, the reason they've taken so long to recover is because um, they've got legacy infrastructure that's really hard to rebuild and restore. Again, a lot of choices and decisions that are in there. There are some, in safety, they've got a number of um, templates and tools that you can use that will step up from um, like hardware to software to some of the management, you know, the team stuff, the management level, right up to sort of board um, regulatory and other big areas. And it's to kind of look at the underlying causes there. I think a tool or a external facilitator helps enormously in those meetings to take people from the real technical detail. Hello, great presentation, thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to what you said about uh, the silence and how you don't mm. hear the silence, and particularly input. So before you get to the incident process, um, getting that information in from your end users, well, I'm, I'm quite fortunate that we do have quite a good area on that, but it's the word incident that I wanted to focus in on and whether you had any thoughts on, or from the people that you spoke to, if you had any great examples of, um, that open communication not involving the word incident. Because if you, if you say to people, oh, if there's an, an incident sounds serious, an incident mm -hmm. sounds like they're going to get involved or they're going to get in trouble. I and mean, we sort of rely on if you see something, say something as an approach. Yes. You know? um, do you have any good examples from other or, or approaches that you've seen that work particularly well for making that open communication possible with your non-technical staff? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And sometimes people talk about events or there is a, a lot of different... It's got to be the right language for um, the organisation you work with. Um, some of the best ones seem to take um, it, stories and examples of people that it happened from. And so they've switched from sort of um, seeing them as, you know, the users made a mistake, they, they weren't aware and they did this and they did that wrong, to actually seeing them as a victim that happened to that. And, and it would be like, Claire, um, uh, you know, di di did this or whatever. She was trying really hard to, you know, go with our corporate objectives and work in doing all of this bit, but this happened. And, you know, and this is telling the story and, and you know, they would make videos of the people that it happened to and share that to engage with lots of other teams. Because a lot of the organisations I spoke to had people, you know, in, in something like hospitality or construction or mining or whatever, you've got people who don't sit in front of a computer every day. So you can't just send them e-training and expect them to know. So that those kind of stories work well to go down through line manager um, and share that in team meetings because it brings it home and, and makes it real about how I should behave and, and why I should behave in that way. Perfect, thank you. And then last quick one. Yeah. Thank you, Claire, for the presentation. My question is probably what next? Um, uh, fairly um, nifty study that you've conducted and key takeaways. Um, 
are you going to conduct any impact evaluation of these key takeaways being implemented in organizations and perhaps measuring some demonstrable evidence of reduction in incidents or effective incident management or effective risk management? So what is it that you're trying to, what is your impact metric of this work? And will you do any impact evaluation with organizations who would implement some of your key takeaways? I haven't got that on my slate of work to do just now. I need to write out my That's PhD plenty. thesis. But one of the papers, and I've just put this up there, the first, the top paper there is a future research agenda as well of all the things to look into. I think one of the ones the gentleman at the back mentioned around in those post-incident review meetings, are you getting to the real causes of it and really looking into that? I'd love to do some research around what's an effective way to get those causes out, what works, what tools, who should you involve, how do you get the most from those. Um, but definitely then um, you know, testing around the effectiveness of once you've got some lessons, does it make a difference? Otherwise, why go through this process? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Claire.